Okay, you gonna let us know what, like you did last time? If anybody got something? Yes. <laughs> I will let you know. I have to look through them, of course. So I will let you know if you got any right, who got the most right. I'll let you know. Um, I apologize because something's wrong with this shade. I tried to get it down, but it's. I think it's affecting the lighting. So um, I apologize. We're gonna talk about chapters, three chapters today. So we got a lot to cover, 16, 14, and 15 uh, deals with coaching and motivation, feedback. Um, so we're gonna go into feedback first. And as a manager, it's important to make sure that you're providing feedback to your employees um, because a lot of times it's something that doesn't happen enough or doesn't happen at all. And it's important because if employees don't know how they're doing, they don't have much room to improve. So. A good performance feedback will always leave both parties, meaning you as a manager and the employee, leaving on a positive note. One person shouldn't leave this gruntled and one person be positive. So the manager should necessarily be happy and the employee leaving the feedback or the evaluation be upset. Each person should be leaving on a positive note, feeling inspired or motivated to improve um, for the future. So what happens during the performance evaluation where you're giving the feedback? Well, first, you have to establish that there's understanding of performance expectations. What that means is, as you're going through the evaluation, you're clearly stating what's expected of the employee, if they're meeting those expectations or if they're not meeting those expectations. All that stuff should be discussed here. You should also talk about training and development. So the types of questions you could ask is, do you feel like you're getting enough training? If not, what type of training would you like to have? Do you have the tools and resources you need to do your job? If not, what do you need to do your job better? These are the types of conversations you should have in your performance evaluation. You should also talk about good things that they did. So if they you know, improved your bottom line by half a million dollars, this is an opportunity, if you have not already done so, to you know, uh, give them praise for that or for their performance if they've, done, if they've done some good things throughout the year or the period that they've been evaluated. And you always wanna make sure that you're helping them develop. So what that means is you're asking questions like, would you like to get that certification? And, you know, are you thinking about going back to school? Those types of questions so that you make sure that they're developing their career and they're not just sitting in the same position that they've been in for five years. So it's obviously always the wrong way to do things. And you know, over time, the process of evaluations has evolved. And so back in the day, evaluations were sometimes based on personality. So I might have a performance evaluation with you and say, your attitude sucks, you're doing a poor job. You could be doing a totally good job. Your attitude might just suck, right? So in an evaluation, it's important that you're really um, focusing in on the actual talent and skills of the employee and not necessarily commingling that with their attitude or their personality because they're actually two separate things. And so it's been a process to try to reform evaluation so that we're getting away from doing that and not um, making a personality you know, into what they're doing as an actual employee and the services and the work that they're providing. So it's important to keep the two separate. While you may need to reprimand them on their behavior and their personality, that may not be indicative of what they're doing. And so you have to make sure that you're providing evaluation and feedback on both of those and not mixing them into one thing. Um, what happens is if you do base evaluations on personality and character and attitudes, you, you are doing a good job at assessment. You aren't thinking about how good of an analyzer they are or how good of a nurse they are. You're thinking about how they behave and not necessarily how they perform. So the less judgmental you are on their personality is going to allow you to have a better overall assessment of that employee and their evaluation. Peer review is, is, is something that I think is growing in popularity. Does anybody know what a peer review is besides peer review articles? Oh, when uh, the staff kind of rates you. Right, right. 
So your peer, you know, someone you work with, your colleague, your coworker, will have input on, on your feedback and how they think you're doing. And sometimes, because you work side by side with them every day, they might be able to provide some really good insight on how you are as an employee. Now, should do you think that this should be the only way that a staff person is evaluated? No, because that person might not like them. Right. Right. So while it may be a good a good way to, to evaluate someone, it probably shouldn't be the only tool that you use because, you know, people may, you know, be manipulative or may not like you or who knows. Right. They try to throw you under the bus. Um, but it's important that you remember that this is an option to use. Um, 360 degree feedback, you might heard of that. Uh, it's an approach that involves everybody, really. It means that feedback doesn't just go from the top down, it also goes from the bottom up. So on a 360 um, type of evaluation, you might see questions rating the employee, but you might also see questions where the employee gets to rate their superior or their supervisor. And it's interesting because I see organizations use this, but I sometimes wonder that you use it. Right, how the information is translated back up and if it's actually applied and considered and reviewed or if they're just doing it to say that they're doing a 360 degree feedback. Mm -hmm. But I think if it's used correctly, it can be a great tool for everybody to improve, not just the people you supervise, but there may be some, you know, some things about you as a manager that should be improved and this gives employees an opportunity to provide that feedback. So in most cases, when you have your evaluation with someone, it is kind of like an interview. If you think about it, you go, you sit in the room, you're probably sitting behind that desk, what we talked about with a barrier, kind of makes you feel intimidated. Um, but it's, it's somewhat like an interview. And what should happen is your job description should always be present. You should always be reviewing the job description just to make sure that the employee is online with what they're supposed to be doing and to make sure that they're not totally doing something different from what they were hired to do. You should go through each performance rating to explain why they received that rating and to pause to see if they have any questions about it. Um, again, go over any accomplishments that they've done throughout the period that you're reviewing. And then also discuss future performance, which is very important because it gives the employee a goal to work forward to. So instead of just saying, wow, you were really great last quarter and leaving it at that, say, wow, you were really great last quarter, but let's see if you can hit this mark for the next quarter. So you always wanna provide something for the future for them to, to uh, move forward to. And they have this acronym called SCRAM, which uh, stands for Specific, Challenging, Relevant, Achievable, and Measurable when you're trying to set goals and objectives in your performance review. So while it doesn't sound like a great acronym, you know, SCRAM, but it's a, it's a good way to remember uh, going through those things when you're trying to set goals for, for the employee. So again, as we talked about in the beginning, you want to make sure everybody leaves on a positive note. So we are ending the evaluation interview. You want to make sure that you uh, put them in a positive note. So if you have negative feedback and positive feedback, you probably want to provide the negative first. That way you can provide the positive feedback at the end and they can leave feeling somewhat motivated and not leaving frustrated or disappointed. After the evaluation is done, you want to make sure that you always follow up. This is something that I don't think happens. Now, when, when should that follow-up be? It depends on the task. You may want to follow up with them next week to see how they're doing. You may want to follow up with them next month. But you want to make sure that if you've set good objectives for them to leave with, that you follow up with them to make sure that they're on the right track, whether that be you guys discussing them going back to school. You might want to check in with them to see if you just fill out an application for FTCC, or whether that be a, a new license, or um, updating their resume, whatever it might be. You want to make sure that you follow up with them. And that also shows them that you're supporting them. You're in their corner. You care about their growth and their development. And you're not just telling them stuff because that's your job. So what are some things that could go wrong in evaluation? Without even looking up here, think about your own evaluations and what you may have experienced so far in your work experiences that went wrong in your evaluation. 
They didn't give you goals. They no didn't give goals. you the positive feedback goals that you needed to achieve your whatever you were looking for. Okay. No goals. Turns into just like a, a nag or bitch session. Okay. So all bad. Yeah. I don't know how else to put it, but that's <laughs> okay. Anybody else? I don't know if the same thing she's saying, but if your manager or supervisor, if y'all don't like one another or y'all have problems in the past, then she may, like you said earlier, she not be um, judging you on your, your work tactic, but so they kind of your feelings. Brought it past your yeah. things from the past. Mm -hmm. They were right. yeah, clear headed. And, and just because she's above you and now you're you know, you know be evaluated by her, she may not judge you or right. evaluate you on your, your skill level. I've seen, I also seen a lot of managers bring in hearsay. Yeah, and they do your yeah. evaluations. Yeah. I heard, I heard, but does that have anything to do with my work ethic? Right. Or how I do my job. What you heard ain't got nothing to do with what I do. So bring it in outside. Outside. Okay. Let's see if any of those are on here. Here's one. There's insufficient positive feedback. You talked about that. Or respect for the employee's self-esteem. Um, the process may not be taken seriously. The manager only has superficial knowledge of their performance, hearsay. Um, documented work standards do not exist. Kind of goes along with the goals that you were talking about. Evaluation consists of highly subjective assessments. I think that's something you talked about. And the evaluator employs excess judging and too little listening. That's important. Um, a lot of times when you go into these evaluations, I find that in my own personal experiences, the manager just talk, 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 talk. You did this, you did that, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, but they didn't listen to anything that you had to say. There may be a they may have been a perfectly good reason for you doing something, but if you're never given the opportunity to, you know, defend yourself or speak to that matter, then it really hasn't been a productive meeting, in my opinion, right? All right. So you want to make sure that as manager, you're definitely listening as much as you're giving feedback. You're receiving what they're saying as well. A few more. Evaluation forms are inadequate. How is an evaluation without a good evaluation form with good standards, good rubrics, right? New objectives are non-specific or weak. If we're gonna set goals, they need to be good goals, measurable, achievable goals, not something that's you know not specific at all or too easy, right? Especially if it's a goal that's tied to a, bo a bonus. Um, reprimands, criticisms were never discussed prior to evaluation. How, how often does that happen? All the time. When, what, what should be happening? When they should, when that problem arises, they should handle that problem at that time. Exactly. Instead of waiting until right. mm -hmm. you go to your evaluation and decide, well, six months ago, you did right. blah, 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 and you shouldn't have did that. Well, you should tell me six months ago because I might have made that mistake within that six months and you're just now bringing it to my attention. Exactly. So, so you definitely want to make sure that you, you're not, you know, being a hoarder of criticism until the evaluation time. It's not like it's picked up. Like right, that. exactly. <laughs> uh, so we've talked about evaluating someone. Coaching is directly related to this because in a performance evaluation, you're giving feedback and you may give some really good feedback to them, but they may not, the employee may not have the motivation or even the knowledge to know how to move forward in achieving the things you want them to do. And so that's why as a manager, you're a coach. Has, it, have, has anybody been a coach before? No? As far as like? In any way. I have a little bit. No. I'm a coach right now. Yeah. I coach um, in a community and regardless of what type of coach you are, you still have the basic fundamental skills that you have to have as a coach when you're working with someone or when you're working with a group or a team. And so they define coaching as an ongoing process when you're help, how you're helping employees fulfill their responsibilities and reach their goals. So what does an effective coach do? They obviously show leadership, exhibit leadership traits. They keep workers informed. Meaning they keep everybody in the loop, nothing's, you know, no information is being ordered, everybody's on the same page, everybody knows what's going on. They show the workers how to get the job done. They help those that have problems. 
listen, we just talked about this, how important listening is. They provide direct negative feedback at results, not people. It's very important because again, as we talked about, you have to make sure that you are separating the two. You cannot blend personality with performance. They're two separate things. So if you're providing negative feedback, it should be at the results of something they did or they did not do and not at the actual person. They set good examples. How good is a coach if they're not being a good example? If, right. If you're telling someone, you know, you can do it or, you know, even if you think in terms of parenting and you have those parents that say, do as I say, not as I do. Are they being a good coach? Are they setting a good example for their kids who are watching them all the time, 24-7? So you want to make sure that you're providing a good example. Um, and as well as coaching, you want to make sure that an effective coach is one that teaches. Um, they're being professional, they're competent, they have knowledge about the things that they're talking about. They're just not talking, they actually know how to do what they're trying to get you to do. So again, if we think about a coach and how important it is to listen, the more time you spend listening to the person you're coaching or the team that you're coaching, the better of a coach you'll become. Why do you think that's the case? Because you all have an a understanding. Everything's out in the open. Nobody is falling behind. Nobody's lagging behind. And it's a good communication system. If the coach is listening, then they're getting more information about what the issues might be or where improvements may lie. But if they're not listening, then they really can't determine where the weaknesses may be or where, they, where the person may really need help at. So it's, it's key to listen, to make sure that you're listening. And one way to achieve this is called management by wandering around. I know it sounds kind of weird, wandering around. Has anybody heard that before? Mm -hmm. uh, well, basically, what it deals with is manager kind of getting out of their office and going into the trenches, walking around, wandering around, meeting with people, rounding, being visible, allowing people to be able to approach you as a manager. And while you're doing this, you're listening more than you're talking. You're observing, you're taking in what the employees are having experience every day so that you can have more knowledge about how to coach them. You're asking for advice. As a coach, you might say, well, why would a coach need advice? about ways you can change yourself. What they think that's not going right with you. If they feel like there's a problem, they can't approach you, they can't talk to you, you're always in your office. That could be something that you might want to change. Right. Um, here are some more things to manage management by wandering around. Take notes, because you're not going to remember everything. So as you're walking around, conversing with people, interacting, just take uh, you know some notes so that when you get back to your office, you can remember everything that you've heard um, calling employees by their names. How much more special does it make you feel to be called by your name than just saying, hey, you, you know, right? More personable. And um, reduces the number of needed memos. Unnecessary meetings mm -hmm. happen all the time. All the time. Well, you can cut down on that if you're walking around and you're interacting with the people. You may be able to have a five-minute conversation with someone that saves you 30 minutes of the you know, useful you know, time that you can be doing something else rather than being in a, a meeting. So while management by walking around, wandering around, sounds like a great idea, there might be some issues, right? Can you think of any? If you wander around too much, you're going to waste time. Right. You're still a manager, right? So you can't spend half a day walking around. I've actually seen this happen, where <laughs> I've worked with people and the managers never in their office. They're always walking there. around. Like How productive are they being? Mm -hmm. Right? It can be also, they may have the intention of being, doing that for, I don't know, for the good, but sometimes they tend to micromanage as they walk around. Right, they could they, micromanage. They, start, you know, micromanaging, oh, well, you should be doing it this way, oh, you know. Right. I've seen it where they got missing in somebody else's office and they sitting there chit-chatting and having coffee, you know, or right. they're walking off and they're somewhere down this way and you need them on this end and they're over here doing something else. And, it, you know, it's, 
Thanks a lot. <laughs> Can you think of any other ones? Maybe by walking around, you become um, like too much a part of exactly. the work scene. That was and the you one I was kind of like on the same level right. instead of maintaining that. Exactly. That's the one that I had in mind. It's, it's a you have to balance. You know, you don't want to wander around to the point where they're calling you by your first name. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and, and while you want to build rapport, you still have to maintain that certain level that they, everybody understands that you're not on the same level with them. You do have a job to do as a manager. So those are a few pitfalls and you want to caution yourself that while it's a great tool to use, you definitely want to walk around and, and get in the trenches. You want to make sure that you're not doing it too much. Another one is that, again, if you're walking around, why you said that they might micromanage too much, it could be the opposite. You might be helping too much. If you're walking around and you see something and you obviously know how to do it, and you, you, know, you go and you help, you want to make sure you're not helping too much either by walking around. You want to make sure that they're still actually doing their jobs as well. So what are some things that coaches do? Well, the first one says they defend and protect employees. You agree with that? A good coach will always be one that will go to bat for you mm -hmm. if issues arise. I've done it. I've done, <laughs> done it. I've done it. I was a, I guess you'd call a manager, platoon sergeant in the army and when my soldiers got in trouble I would be like, first sergeant, just just give it to me. Just give me the counsel statement. I'll take it. Right. You know, I didn't tell them. I obviously didn't show them the right way. So give it to me and let me fix it. Right. I think we all have done it. That's, that's what an effective coach does. Um, you want to empower your staff to make sure that they feel engaged and motivated to do things they do. And you always want to provide support when they need it. We just talked about this on the reprimand side. It goes the same for praise. When you're a coach and you see something good happening, you don't want to wait. You want to praise them immediately when it happens, give them that positive feedback so that they truly understand that what they did was something that helped the organization or helped their team, that it didn't go overlooked. So what do you praise? Praise everything? No. No? Oh, if you praise everything, it just makes it seem like they're a spoiled little kid. So you come to work and I shouldn't praise you? Yeah, but if you come to work on time for a straight month and you were never late, yeah, I will praise you. Would you praise? I don't know if I would I praise. I wouldn't praise that. That's what you're expecting I mean, to do. Yes. It, there's certain things I mean you would you would let them know especially if you're the only reason I say like to come to work on time if you actually your your shift if you're managing has a problem with coming to work on time or let's say there you have certain ones that are always late and you have this certain two three four people that actually come to work on time do their job leave on time those would be the ones that I would show okay this is how you need look this this is what we need to work on. Somebody's shaking their head. I Let's would. talk about this for a little bit. I, mean, I wouldn't do that. If they're coming to late all the time, they need to be reprimanded and they need to be corrected. Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then you need to start writing them up and getting them out of there because that's not what you want. Right. The ones that are coming to work on time, that's what they're expected to do. I wouldn't praise them. That's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Now, if they did something extraordinary and was going above and beyond, mm -hmm. then I would praise them for it. If they're coming in early to carry the weight of the other people that are coming in late, then I might pray, hey, thank you for coming in. Really appreciate this, you know, stuff like that. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't praise them just for coming to work. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? How are we feeling? I'm kind of with Mary. I'm a, I'm a big stickler about, you know, it's, it's your expectation. It's, it, that's what's expected of you. You need to do what is expected of you. Don't praise something that you should already be doing. That's, and that's what it says here. You want to make sure that it's something that's above and beyond the call of duty. I would think that arriving on time is probably something in line with what is expected. Um, and it says that are not always expected or not usually part of their job. So you want to make sure that you're careful with your praise. You're not praising too much. Because like you said, it could you know, crush, give them a crush or make them spoiled. So you want to make sure that you're Praising the things that are just marvelous and not just the things that are good or okay. Here are some more when not to praise. 
and our hands are praised when it is clearly insincere. <laughs> that fake pat on the back, right? It should be very sincere. You should actually mean it when you're praising someone. No. Right, exactly. <laughs> Do not praise when it is not earned. You're wasting everybody's time and resources and money. Do not praise when doing so might embarrass you, the recipient, or others. When might that happen? When they're doing more than you. When they're doing more than you, exactly. If you're praising them for something that they did that was probably something you should have done, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're embarrassing yourself, right? Great example, that's what I was thinking of. Do not praise before you're certain who has really earned it. And yes, that's, that's very important. Problem. Because it might have been a team effort, but it may have just appeared to be one person. Mm -hmm. While it might have been some people working in the, in, you know, behind the scenes, helping as well to get it done. So you want to make sure that you've invest done some praise investigation mm -hmm. before you hand out praises to make sure that you know exactly who to thank or who to praise for the job that was done. Feedback criticism. We're talking about praise and being a coach. So we have to remember that when you're coaching someone and you're providing praise or feedback, a lot of it deals with your delivery, right? how you deliver the message, how you say it, even your body language and that you exhibit towards that person that you're providing feedback to. How legitimate you believe the criticism to be. Does that ever happen? You receive feedback or criticism and you're questioning if it's legit or not? Mm -hmm. Who else hears it? Why is this important? I, I think that it, feedback, especially criticism, should be done on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It should never be a case where other people can hear that you're criticizing someone else. Rumors spread like wildfire. Rumors spread. You don't want to embarrass well, that embarrass. person. And you don't want the other people to get the wrong idea of what you were talking about because they overheard certain things. Right. So how do you criticize someone without making them feel low or beneath you or useless? You always ask them if, you know, let them know that you've seen them do certain things that they might want to improve on in order to move up in the company. You might want to change the way you do this and change it, maybe change it this way. But not really making them feel low to the ground, but actually giving them some insight on maybe how to move up without tearing them down. Yes. You're doing a good job on this side, but you might want to work on this, this, that, and the other and change it around, maybe a little bit, twerk it like this, and you know, you can move up. But if you continue to follow the path, then we're gonna have to go to other avenues. So it sounds like you're saying giving them something, while you're, while you're criticizing them, giving them something to look forward yeah. to. Okay, anybody else? I was gonna say positive guidance, like resources and stuff that can help them along the way. Right. And uh, get them back to where they need to be. But not actually criticize them, talking to them like one on one basis and just saying, hey, look, I noticed this, let's fix this. But if you need help with this, here's some resources and here's some guidance that can help you along the way. I think, along with delivery, environment helps too. You know, I've, re I've received criticism over lunch before, and I felt like that made it a little less. You know, painful. Easier to um, take in. <laughs> <The icebreaker. laughs> yeah. Yeah, the full stomach. So right. Know, at least, you know, so, you know, I was criticized, but at least I got lunch, you know, so. <laughs> so, so I think environment can help too. Maybe, maybe if you take them outside of that office environment that we were talking about behind that desk and, and you know, why you may not take them to lunch, take them to the break room or something to, to criticize or provide feedback. Also, um, to go off what she was saying, like resources, talking to them. Like, um, I would be talking to them and, you know, be like, hey, this is what I've noticed. And, you know, not just keep on talking, like, let them put some input in too. I mean, like, you know, how can we fix this? How can you, you know, better what you're doing? So let them get some input in. Instead what of just talking to help you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead so of just talking to help you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Nurturing a little bit. All right. I mean, it's easier when you know where your problem is. If you have that problem, it's better if you know from their point of view where that problem is coming from. So then you know exactly how to criticize it and fix it instead of just pointing a finger like, you need to straighten up, you need to do this, you need to do that. I think that's a, a great point 
that, you know, getting to the root issue of why you're even criticizing them. There's been issues where, you know, I may have made mistakes and maybe it was because I was tired because I'm not getting enough rest. But if the manager doesn't know what the root issue is, the criticism that they're giving may not be as helpful as it could be. So I think that's a good point that you bring up. Uh, coaching pitfalls. Obviously, you can't use the same approach with every single person. Everyone's different. While I may have to be very stern with you, I may have to be very nurturing with you. But it may allow me to get the same result. So you have to make sure that you cater your coaching approach to different employees, depending on, you know, the personality or the, the work style or whatever it may be. It'd be great if you knew them. Right, <laughs> right, definitely. <laughs> Another pitfall, you can't think that you know everything. You're a coach, you're a great co coach, but you may not have all the answers. If you pretend to be this way, then what you, what's gonna happen is you may lose trust because the minute they find out that you don't actually know what you're talking about or what you're coaching about, they're not going to trust you anymore. You can hurt employee morale. Um, neglecting the coaching process because you don't have time. Who has time to coach with managers? They're putting out fires every day in hospitals and nursing homes, and, right? You no, know, it's part of being a good manager right. is to coach. Exactly. Is to make sure your staff is where they need to be. If you're not coaching them and your staff falls below what they need to do, then it comes back on you so that you're not doing your job. Exactly. <coughs> so don't neglect the coaching process. And you don't want to label employees, right? Does that happen? Mm -hmm. Have we all been labeled? Mm -hmm. I've been labeled. I have. We already talked about addressing attitude and personalities. Overusing criticism. Can that happen? It's our job to criticize with managers. They don't mean go overboard. I mean every little thing, you nitpicking at every little thing. You know, that's just overboard. It's, you need to make sure it's the right criticism for the right thing. Right. Not just nitpicking. And that goes along with you don't want to overcoach. You don't want to provide advice on everything. A part of, you know, staff development is growing. They do. They do have to make some mistakes and learn. And you can't handhold them and overcoach because they won't. They may not grow. So how do we motivate them? Still going along the lines of coaching and evaluating. How do we motivate them? Rewards. Rewards. What types of rewards? Recognition. Recognition. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure that we're providing good recognition and rewards that positively affect their morale. The yearly review. You know when they give you, I don't know how to explain that. I forgot. Never mind. Never mind? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here are some things that will directly affect morale. And we have, we have to think about these things when we're providing rewards and recognition and we're doing coaching. Personality, right? If you have a manager and their personality is just the worst, it's going to directly affect morale, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Nature of the job, fulfilling or unrewarding. If your employees are just have no opinion on their job either way and that it's just blah and they're just coming in every day. You want to make sure that they feel like the job they're doing is fulfilling. Right? Attitude and behaviors of the manager and the organization. I've seen situations where an employee would, would love their manager but hate the organization as a whole. Hate the organizational culture, the policies, so I stop there because it's important to know that just because you're doing a great job as a manager, it could still affect the morale of your employees if they're unhappy with the organization as a whole or the employer as a whole, right? Quality of supervision definitely affects morale, right? Mm -hmm. How are you doing as a leader? How are you treating your employees? Are you respecting them? Are you treating them like 
low people, laymen. You don't want to treat your employees like they're grunt workers. That's right. one thing that you don't want to. That puts them at the bottom of the totem pole and really doesn't make them want to come to work and want to do their job because right. they don't feel respected. Right. And going on what you're saying, here's some signs that there's a problem. Productivity is going down. They started out worker bee. Now they're going down. Calling out. They're calling out, they're coming in late, right? Complaining mm -hmm. every day about oh, something. They don't want to change. Resistant to change. They don't want to help out. They don't want to stay late. They don't want to come in early, like you mentioned. Turnover, they just leave, mm -hmm. right? Just don't come to work one day. I ain't calling it. Just, don't just leave. Up. I'm not coming back. Oh, uh, well, you can tell me. It happened yesterday. It happens all the time. Exactly. It happens all the time. So, how do we improve that? Spending more time where work is taking place. We just talked about this management by wandering around, ensuring that job candidates are carefully screened. This is important because this goes back to what we talked about a few weeks ago in interviewing and making sure that you're screening good candidates. Providing timely training. Establishing a problem solving culture. Controlling rumors. How do you control rumors? Get them in the bud, right? Yeah, stop them when they start. Stop them when they start. As soon as you hear it. Mm -hmm. How can we influence, personally influence morale? We have to provide information. Everybody should know why they're doing whatever they're doing. If they have any questions, we should have no problems with answering them. We want to provide an optimist environment, a positive environment. If you hear people complaining, stop it right there. Don't let it fester, right? How about this one? Assigning discouraged workers to teams of go-getters. Sometimes you have to surround that one cancerous employee with positive people to try to, you know, get some of that positive energy onto they them, right? Give them motivation, right. maybe, right. that they need to, and maybe a little bit more challenging because right. they got to step up. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think that's a great one. Not just that; it's finding out why they're discouraged. What What's the problem? What Why are you having a problem at work? <laughs> what about this one? Introducing more flexible work schedules. This one's a great one. I, I saw this, uh, an organization I was with provided people the opportunity to work four tens, meaning four days a week, 10 hours, and it, the morale went through the roof. People were very appreciative of this <coughs> and felt like the organization was actually thinking about them as an employee, especially those people that were having to commute in you know, an hour commute, that 410 just really raised their morale through the roof because they, they were appreciative of the fact that they no longer had to drive into town five days. They could, you know, afford it. Or even giving people the option to work from home one day. I've also seen that be used and that, that also increases the morale. That's becoming more and more popular today. Right. So being flexible. Again, keeping staff fully informed. Becoming a change agent. Involving employees in decision making and planning. That's a great one. People like to feel involved. They never want to feel like things are going on behind their backs. Mm -hmm. That always turns that morale negative when people think that the management or the organization is doing things behind their backs and they're not involving them. Or they wait till they get to a meeting and this is a new rule. Or right. This is what we've established or this, that, and the other. It's right. kind of hard. Helping employees obtain raises. If, that, if money doesn't increase morale, I don't know what will, right? Mm. <laughs> we'll stop there. She actually got to give me the money. <laughs> I didn't email you because she had very close.